All right. We're live. Apparently, the link is now working. <clears throat> We're figuring out YouTube as we go. Uh, trying to figure out what this thing is doing. Um, hopefully, we'll uh, kick some of the mud off the tires for this whole thing is over. Anyway, welcome. Cheers. Sunday night, June 14th, 2020. The country feels hopeful. Is partly on fire. It's what we're here to talk about. Um, thanks for everybody joining, uh, everybody uh, getting involved in this conversation, sending questions, all that stuff. Um, I'm just going to hang around for a little while and uh, do this thing and just talk about some stuff. Um, yeah. So first things first, um, I, I, I streamed last week and I talked a lot about uh, feeling hope for the first time in forever, uh, which was a really foreign concept for me. Um, unfortunately, in the past few years that I've been doing this uh, political analysis thing and, and writing about it and the, the journalism that I do, um, it's been pretty bleak. I'm sure that you felt it as well. Um, you know, we have watched America sort of get swallowed by uh, its own inherent problems. And uh, I, mean, I mean, and let's be honest, we descended into madness. There's really no other way to say it. Um, the past couple of weeks have provided some of the first real glimpses of hope that I've seen. Uh, I was telling somebody not too long ago that, um, you know, American politics is like a really, really heartbreaking thing. And it'll tear your heart out and tear it in two. And the victories are so few and far between. Um, and, and, and maybe there are some people, maybe even there are some people here, um, you know, hanging out in this live stream who maybe they didn't pay as much attention to politics before. Um, I, I hate to tell you, but the, 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 the story of American politics is, again, heartbreaking. There aren't a lot of victories. And I think that um, I think that this is one of the moments where we should feel hopeful. But one of the things I wanted to talk about, and this is actually one of the first questions I got um, is why are the Black Lives Matter protest not getting as much attention right now? And what is happening? And that, that comes from Sarah. Um, and why there was so much momentum in terms of media narrative and why it has sort of fallen off a little bit, which is something that I've gotten... I've gotten pissed off about. It. I've gotten pretty frustrated by it. I assume that maybe you have as well. Um, you know, when this thing started, particularly in Minneapolis, there was, um, you know, there was a lot of rage uh, about what had happened, about the murder of George Floyd and the, the continual brutality by America's law enforcement. Uh, and we watched on TV, you know, as buildings were set on fire and as there were clashes between um, law enforcement and protesters. And it, there's no other way to put it because this is the conversation we're having. Uh, it made it, it made for good TV, right? I mean that that that's un unfortunately what we're dealing with right now is is unfortunately American politics has become a television show. Um, you know, one of the things that has concerned me the most is that. Um, it's been turned into a spectacle. It's, it's, it's an entertainment. You know, when you watch cable news and when you watch mainstream media, um, you're watching a TV show. And I, I think a lot of us have noticed that over the past couple of years, particularly with the rise of Trump. I mean, there's a reason why every single network, regardless of ideology, um, you know, brought Trump on and gave him time because he was great copy. He was great for ratings. He was great for all of that. So the, the truth is that American journalism for the most part, is tuned to destruction. Um, the American economy is tuned to destruction. It's, it, it rewards things that are really damaging to society and to people because those are the things that I think people find interesting. The shift that happened in the beginning of the protest, in the, the protest and I wrote about this, so you start having these police go out in order to restore law and order. And the protesters, you know, would meet them head on and, you know, they would shoot them with rubber bullets. They would, you know, um, brutalize them and beat them. And while we watched it in horror, people were still watching. Right. I mean, ratings went up. Social media posts went up. All the sharing went up. And then the, the outrage that came from that, that, that watching that horror, the, 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 the outrage that birthed from that 
um, led to police being pulled off. And all of a sudden you started to see the conflict sort of move away. And the problem, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this before this uh, live stream is over. One of the problems is in-depth conversations like this one and in-depth conversations that are needed to make policing better and make politics better, make society better. They're complicated. They're really, really hard to have. Um, you know, one of the thing, things that we've seen over the past couple of weeks, and, and I'm sure you've seen this as well, has been a debate over whether or not defund police is an effective uh, rhetorical thing to say. And that that's sort of the, the crux of what's wrong with America is like we have taken a really complex thing, politics, and which is supposed to be about how you and I come together in the public square. We discuss facts and then we decide based on our different opinions how to move forward. They've taken it and they've made it a television show. Uh, it, you know, and, the, and that's one of the reasons why Republicans have enjoyed the success they have is because they are much more willing to go to that primal sort of reptilian brain part that is like, oh, no, politics is about fear and immediate reaction and feelings as opposed to, you know, nuanced conversation. That's one reason why the protests have received less coverage. The second thing is media narratives are always looking for another story. Um, they, they want to be able to control what's happening. They want to control what the conversation is. So while CNN or an MSNBC are what you would consider, consider either centrist or center left or liberal, whatever you want to call them, American politics isn't actually that simple. Um, you know, the, these cable news channels are actually corporate entities. And even MSNBC, which would be considered the liberal cable news network, is still a corporate bias status quo network. That doesn't mean that they're evil. It doesn't mean that they're trying to kill people or, you know, drive people into poverty. It just so happens to be how they digest what happens in the world and how they present it. Um, and and when she, once you start realizing that, you start to realize that American politics isn't this simple flat spectrum from left to right, because neither really exists anymore. I mean, the Republican Party isn't conservative. The Republican Party is right in terms of how they operate and what they're trying to achieve. But they're not fiscally conservative. I mean, Trump is running up record deficits. They're not socially conservative. Look what they put up with with Trump. Um, you know, they're not actually pro-life. They're going to make you and me go into the jaws of a generational pandemic and possibly die. They're not even interested in providing us the things that would be necessary to create, you know, create a system where we could have decent lives or sustained life. It's a political cudgel. So that spectrum that we've all seen, it doesn't really exist. It's much more three-dimensional and complicated. And so when we start having conversations about this, what we're missing is that the media wants to take something like the Black Lives Matters protest and make them very easily digestible. Uh, this is about George Floyd and his murder. And so one of the things I found in my book is that the media learned how to cover stuff like this based on national tragedies, like the Oklahoma City bombing, which unfortunately, unfortunately is like one of the um, keystone events in American history that just keeps on giving, man. It, it, it is, um, it's a really bad thing that happened, and it's informed a lot of what's happened afterwards. But they go to the place where the tragedy has happened. They stay for a couple of days. They talk to people. They get the usual sound bites. I can't believe it happened here. I can't believe this is happening. We have to do something. They have a funeral or a memorial service, and then we digest it and we move on to the next thing. A sustained political movement does not work that way. I mean, we're God knows how many days into this, and people are still in the streets, but they have to give you new entertainment. They have to give you new things to watch and new things to process, and that's the way they keep people watching. Um, last night... So I live in Georgia, um, and I've driven by that Wendy's uh, that got uh, set on fire last night, the one that uh, where, where the murder had occurred. You know, immediately, CNN, which hadn't been covering the protest and hadn't really been talking about things outside of, like, the narrative of it, they went to it like that. It was on fire. There was drama in the streets between the protesters and the police. And suddenly there was a new story to talk about. And that's just how the economic system of news works now, which is unfortunate. And I, I, I think, I think it's, it's, it's been pretty, pretty dangerous up to this point. All right. I got asked by Yvette, is there a direct correlation between the resurgence of the Klan with the debut of W D W Griffith's birth of a nation Did this contribute to the 1921 Tulsa massacre? Um, listen, I, 
I think this is a really interesting part of American history that people don't talk about. It's one of the things that I keep writing about. Um, you know, we, 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 we talk about the Civil War in our, our education, in our books, as if it just ended and that was it, which is kind of nuts. You know, we, we had an entire part of the country that went into rebellion and lived as a, a distant, distinct country. And then they were conquered militarily and we just expected them to be assimilated, you know, in, in back into the country. It doesn't work that way. Um, Southerners continued their heritage, they continued their feelings, and the Confederacy was actually absorbed into America, into its laws, its politics, and its culture. Um, W.D. Griffith's uh, Birth of a Nation, which if you haven't seen it, I would act actually recommend watching it. Uh, I'd always heard about it, and I had never actually watched it because it's disgusting and repellent. But when you watch it, what you actually see is you see pure propaganda. You see a lie about American politics and history um, that did, has no relationship whatsoever to reality. And what you see is you see a post-Civil War South where African-Americans overwhelm the culture. They take everything over. They're, they're criminals. They're sexual predators. And meanwhile, you have a bunch of carpetbaggers who are manipulating them. And what it actually is, is it is the concentrated, undiluted conspiracy theory of the South, which has continued to this day. Um, you know, we can talk about the New World Order. We can talk about the deep state. We can talk about QAnon. It's the exact same story, which is that minorities are being manipulated by shadowy people, usually Jewish cabals, and that they are trying to destroy white power. Well, Birth of a Nation was inspired by a book called The Klansman, a couple of books by uh, a guy named Thomas Dixon. Uh, who wrote these novels. And Thomas Dixon, um, he, he wanted to change the history of the South. And so he wrote these novels, and they were partly based off the research of Woodrow Wilson, who would go on to become president of the United States. Um, so I'm, I'm an academic. I'm a professor. Um, it gives me no joy to say this. Woodrow Wilson was a disgusting, racist academic who when he, he wrote, um, you know, all these books about the history of America. And whenever he got to the Civil War, which was the main purpose of this thing, he talked about how the South had a noble cause and that they were good people. And the relationship between slaveholders and slaves was paternal and loving and charming. You know, it's all this antebellum bullshit that you've all, you know, been inundated with at some point or another. So Wilson writes this book. And Thomas Dixon was actually his classmate at college. They studied under the same professors. They kept constant uh, correspondence back and forth to each other. And they talked to each other constantly about white supremacy and wanting to see the South both revised in history, but also, you know, a return to power for the South. They believed in white supremacy and they believed that African-Americans should be, uh, you know, subjected to white supremacy. So Wilson writes his history books. Thomas Dixon then turns them into novels, which then become D.W. Griffith's um, uh, uh, movie, Birth of a Nation, uh, which actually Woodrow Wilson screened at the White House and basically told everybody, like, this is wonderful. This is how we should teach history. This is, you know, it's, uh, I think he said something along the lines of this is history taught with lighting. And it's this really disgusting moment in American history where all of a sudden Woodrow Wilson who sort of creates the modern American propaganda system. He starts using all of these propagandists. Uh, Creel is one. Edward Bernays, who is actually um, Sigmund Freud's nephew, he brings him in. And so before we go into World War I, Woodrow Wilson is like, okay, there's an opportunity. All these European countries are killing each other left and right. They're destroying each other. They're spending all their money. They're killing generations of young men. America can swoop in as the heroes and become the peace brokers and sort of become the leading nation in the world. But Wilson and Creel and Bernays, they all look at this thing and they're like, okay, if we're going to be the leaders of the world, then we have to be perfect. We have to be, I don't know, a shining city upon a hill. So what they do is they actually go through American culture and they completely take away all of our problems, everything from white supremacy to economic inequality. And Creel sort of is a total sycophant for Wilson. And man, there is a there is room for like a really good biography of Creel to be written. Creel goes out and he says, oh, if you read our papers, if you read our news, you would say that America is a racist, crime ridden, in unequal country. And he's like, that can't be true. We, we're the heroes of the world. So he goes out, completely redoes all this stuff. 
And so what ends up happening because of Wilson and Creel and Griffith and Dixon is you create this new revised confederacy where all of a sudden it was just a bunch of brothers fighting each other, right? It was, it was, man, it's really terrible that they had to fight. And it's really terrible that they were brought to that position because of African-Americans. But then all of a sudden you start scrubbing American history of white supremacy. And all of a sudden you start saying, okay, well, maybe they shouldn't have been slaves, but maybe they, it'd be better if there was still a paternal relationship between whites and blacks. So all of a sudden it's not racism. You care about them. Right. And this is like a really, really insane sort of a, a mindset, which has really directed the way we talk about American history. Um, this is one of the reasons why now they talk about a heritage, not hate. It's why we have people with guns gathering around Confederate monuments. It's why it's OK. Well, not OK, but it's, you know, quote unquote, politically acceptable for the president of the United States to go out there and say, oh, you know, these people are part of our history. We shouldn't change the name of these bases. We shouldn't get rid of these statues. It's because of all of that propaganda work that happened at the turn of the 20th century. So absolutely, uh, Birth of a Nation and Wilson and Creel and Bernays, they had a big giant part to do with revising American history and, and creating this um, white supremacist hidden under the surface state that we live in now that, uh, that fortunately is being torn down during these protests. Oh, okay. Here's here's a related question. <clears throat> Armed white supremacist ye Yehus. I like Yehus. I'm from the Midwest. We gotta call everybody Yehus, right? Going out and guarding statues of colonizers and racists. Why do the cops protect them yet brutalize peaceful BLM protesters? What is really happening here? So let's have a drink on that. So here is one of the con concepts that has plagued America. And one of the things that Black Lives Matter is doing an incredible job of destroying. The police in this country, law enforcement officers, have long enjoyed this unearned status um, where they cannot be questioned. Like to become a police officer means that all you care about is the law. Why would you dedicate your life to it? And, and in essence, they sort of become priest-like figures. Right. They're taken away from the population and all of a sudden their entire lives are dedicated to protecting the law. Right. And we start telling these stories that, you know, officers are only doing things because they know what's right and they're there to protect us. And if they don't do it, then, you know, our entire society will be destroyed. Yada, yada, yada. Uh, a lot of this has to do. And, and this is weird, but follow me for a second. A lot of this has to do with uh, this Roman legion concept where it, it was this old idea that the general on the ground uh, could be basically be a conduit to God. And so the generals who were in the middle of a battle could be the arbiters of what was wrong and what was right, what was noble and what was cowardly. And this is actually something that um, Andrew Jackson brings into American culture. Uh, a lot of his propagandists um, uh, start writing these books that are like, OK, when Andrew Jackson was a general, he I mean, he broke so many uh, parts of the Constitution. He infringed on people's constitutional rights constantly. In order for him to become president, they had to push this idea of this Roman general uh, idea, philosophy of the law, which is if I do it, it's not unlawful and it's not illegal because I am an arbiter of God and I'm going to make the choice on the spot between life and death and right and wrong. That has carried through American culture which we've seen America constantly uh, infringe on the rights of people around the world. We've seen them, you know, take over governments. We've seen them overturn democratic elections. We've seen them suppress people and movements. And it also takes place with our law enforcement. We have looked at them as if they're a priest class, as if they have no inherent bias whatsoever and that they have no prejudices. That's impossible. All of us have prejudices. All of us have bias. The reason why they're not going after these protesters who are protecting Confederate statues, the reason they're not going after militias who are strapped with AR-15s, they're telling them, oh, go in here because we're getting ready to deploy tear gas. The reason why they didn't crack skulls in Michigan whenever these assholes went in with their AR-15s and knocked down legislatures is because there's a racial bias. That sounds very simplistic, but it's true. There, there's a reason why when you look at the pictures back and forth, you see white supremacists with assault weapons, like yelling in the face of police. And then you see African-Americans in the street 
protesting and then getting their skulls cracked is because there's an inherent bias. And that American history and American culture and political culture and also mass media and popular culture are rife with the idea that people of color, particularly African-Americans, if, if they're not policed and they're not suppressed, then they'll destroy things and they'll kill people, which actually goes back to what I was just talking about with the myth of the Confederacy and the lost cause narrative. The idea is that America's greatest enemy is people of color, which actually is how America started. Um, you know, I don't want to get off on too big of a rant of it, but James Madison, Ale Alexander Hamilton, um, the, the whole group of them, when they're forming government, they're talking about how to, you know, put down rebellions. They're talking about the dangers of, of minorities coming together and, and creating change. The entirety of this country is based on that concept. And, and unfortunately, everything I'm talking about right now is not only true, it's hard to talk about. And one of the reasons it's hard to talk about and one of the reasons why I, I, you know, I'm not on cable news talking about this right now is because it's not simple and it's not comfortable. And it, 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 makes, it makes white viewers uncomfortable because we have to look at our own privilege and our own place in it. Um, and that's a hard thing. It's a hard but necessary thing. And we have to start doing it. We have to start having conversations about it. But it looks like racial prejudice because it's racial prejudice. That's, that's just the long and the short of it. I got asked, do I get threats? Absolutely, I do. Uh, I have spent the last, let me see, it's 2020. I've been covering the Trump movement since 2015. I first started getting noticed in 2016. I've been dealing with threats pretty constantly since 2016. Um, it doesn't make me special. I think anybody who covers politics in this modern moment, unfortunately, is, uh, is in danger. I've talked to a lot of reporters who don't want to be public about it because they don't want to draw it in and they don't want problems with it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've had people show up at my house left and right. I've had people threaten my life and, and the people in my life. Um, I've been stalked pretty constantly. But the, the, the whole point of saying this and being honest about it is that it's a movement. It's a fascistic movement. And what happens in fascist countries, unfortunately, in authoritarian states, is that people who know better and can speak up against it are silenced. And me and a bunch of the people I know who work in journalism and work in politics um, refuse to be silenced. I, 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 I Listen, I, I understand that my life is a risk and, and, and that's how it is, but I'd rather do that than not be able to sleep at night knowing that I didn't say the things that I needed to say. Uh, but you need to understand that, that journalists and politicians in this country um, are unnecessarily threatened and in fear of their lives constantly. Um, that, that, that's one of the things that, you know, I wish journalists would talk about more because people need to understand it, it's, it's an infection in the political moment. And it's, it's how authoritarianism and fascist states start. Uh, Claudia, does Trump need minority voters? Can he win with just the white vote? Um, that's a great question. Um, I try really hard not to prog prognosticate anymore because most of us, whenever we prognosticate and predict things, um, we're just doing it in order to, uh, sort of make our opinions sound stronger and like they're based on something. I was telling somebody the other day, polls are such bullshit. And every time somebody like throws around a poll and is like, it means this, it means that it really doesn't mean anything. This is all guesswork. And we don't know anything until the votes are counted. Um, all I know right now is that the Republican Party, the reason why they are the way they are, is because over the past few decades, um, they have continually staked their entire political survival on the support of prejudiced white people and uh, a, a, a white minority of the country, unfortunately. Um, they, they have moved away from actually representing a majority of the country or trying to buy for a part of the country. And they have instead uh, bet their entire political careers and lives and fortunes on propaganda and creating an alternate reality that doesn't look anything like our own. I don't know. I don't know if he's going to win. I don't know how it's going to happen. Um, I, I wouldn't feel comfortable either way right now. I, I, I don't know if he'll stay there. I don't know if he'll listen to the election. I said this last week. Um, you know, if, if you have any doubt about whether or not Donald Trump might uh, contest a free and fair election, which who knows if we'll have a free and fair election. I'll talk about Georgia in a minute. I saw that question. 
if you really want to know about it, like go back and look at 2012 when Mitt Romney lost. Donald Trump started tweeting about a revolution and how Americans should march on Washington because, you know, it was time for a new civil war. He didn't even like Mitt Romney. He just hated Barack Obama that much. Um, do I think he'll accept defeat? No, I think he's delusional and I think he's lost in his own mind. But the only reason that he can win an election, the only reason he won in 2016, the only w- reason he could possibly win in 2020 is because of the Electoral College. And if we want to go back into you know what we were talking about, the Electoral College was set up as a deal between uh, the people who framed the Constitution. And they did it because they wanted the South to join them. And so that they, they gave the slave South, um, you know, more weight in terms of how to determine presidential elections. It should go away. It should be completely eradicated. And the fact that we don't talk about it as, you know, an artifact of uh, slavery within America, I think is a total, total shame. But yeah, he could, he could win. Unfortunately, he, he could win. And I think that's something that we all need to recognize and, and work against. Matthew asked, why is it that journalists are not rallying to address and challenge these conspiracies head on? There's a couple things here. I'm really glad you asked that. Um, first things first, and, and I assume that you've seen this, and this is something that I've watched um, happen over the past couple of years. Journalists don't like to talk about conspiracy theories because they sound insane, right? Like if you if you give air to something like QAnon, like if you've never actually looked at QAnon and seen what it's actually about, spend an afternoon. It's madness. It, it makes no sense. They're talking about JFK Jr. faking his death and Baron Trump being a time traveler and, you know, reptilian shit. It's insane. So to talk about it feels like you're giving it legitimacy, right? But here's the truth, and this is what I keep trying to tell people, and I wish that people would really listen and grasp and and really roll around with. American politics and American culture is more or less defined by conspiracy theories, The New World Order isn't just something that people throw around whenever, you know, they put on their tinfoil hats. Like, when you turn on Fox News, the entire message of Fox News is the New World Order. That's it. Whenever they talk about, oh, George Soros is doing this, they're talking about uh, protocols of the elders of Zion. Whenever they talk about protesters taking over in Seattle or, you know, burning down buildings or they, you know, they they talk about black on white crime. They're talking about the possibility that manipulated, manipulated people of color could rise up and destroy the country. Whenever they talk about Democrats and liberals not loving America and wanting to destroy America, they're talking about fifth columns. Fox News is just a really dressed up New World Order conspiracy theory. That's all they're peddling to people. It's an alternate reality, and it keeps white voters terrified. Now, Going back to the beginning of America and then the Confederacy and then throughout from the beginning of the 20th century to now, America has been defined by white supremacist paranoia. It's this idea that our power is going to be destroyed by an outside enemy who is somehow or another going to lead to a revolution within America. Um, That's American politics. That's what the right has been pushing all along. It happened at the turn of the 20th century. Uh, unfortunately, you saw it after World War I during the Red Summer where African Americans were slaughtered and lynched and everyone said it was because of communist interference. Even the New York Times, um, you know, post Second World War, you saw it constantly with the McCarthy purging of government of all the New Dealers and FDR's people. Um, you see it now. I mean, that's what they say when they're talking about Obama. It's what they talk about with Biden. It's what they talk about with Clinton. All of it's conspiracy theories. So to actually address it would mean that our media would have to basically completely deconstruct American history, say, you know, the stuff that we've talked about and the stuff that we thought was real wasn't real. And that will upset a lot of people because the moment that you start realizing it, the moment you start realizing that American history is based on not just prejudice, but conspiracy theories and stuff that we thought was true, but really isn't. All of a sudden, you have to start looking in the mirror for yourself and understanding that maybe the stories you've told you told yourself about yourself aren't true, that maybe you have privilege and maybe that you've benefited from that. It's a big, tall order, and it doesn't work in a five minute segment on CNN when you have like six people trying to talk. Um, but it, I'm, I'm, I've been very happy lately that luckily they've started talking about the deep state and QAnon and sort of dissecting it. But they miss the point, which is that these aren't new phenomena. It just so happens that in the digital age, they're even more powerful. And particularly in the political moment, they're more powerful.
and and but America has always been held captive by conspiracy theories from the very beginning. Okay. Matthew asked, as a result of the Trump presidency, what effects do you foresee related to evangelical theocratic aspirations? Um, that is that is the sixty four thousand dollar question right there. I don't know. Um, I, I, I grew up, for those who aren't familiar, I grew up in uh, the evangelical church, what I've come to call white identity, neo-confederate cult of the shining city, which is my term that means to take evangelicalism and sort of separate it from this nationalist right wing movement that we're now all um, endangered by. I grew up in it. And I can tell you from my time in it, it's based on paranoia and it's based on fear. And the people that we're talking about, we're talking about dominionists, we're talking about evangelicals, we're talking about, you know, the people who believe that America is God's chosen nation and, you know, that Satan and conspiracies are trying to take it down. They literally believe that if one thing goes wrong, that if the wrong bill gets passed, if, I don't know, a vaccine for a pandemic, you know, gets in the wrong hands, that that's it. They have been taught by their preachers and by their political leaders that they can't lose anything because they're under attack. They're being encircled and they're being encircled by people who want to exterminate them and they're being attacked constantly. So they can't lose. So it, it unfortunately is very paranoid and very martyrish and that isn't going to go away. I mean, there, there are obviously statistics that show that people left and right, um, you know, are sort of rejecting this stuff. But that doesn't mean that that generation is going to give up on it. And unfortunately, we've seen that they can be weaponized. Um, they can become very, very extreme and radicalized. They've killed people. Um, you know, they've sent bombs to people. Uh, who knows what this QAnon Christian sort of marriage is going to create? I mean, it's, it's total fascism. They've totally supported Donald Trump's fascist turn, you know, with the Bible and everything else. They hold him up as a cult leader um, that can't be questioned. Um, you know, what will happen after Donald Trump? I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm really worried about what will happen with white identity, neo-confederate evangelicalism uh, in the future. Because their literal faith and the faith that I grew up in and the faith that so many people I know grew up in and a lot of these political leaders they really want to take over the world because they believe that is the only way that they can make the world safe and prepared for a second coming of Jesus Christ and the end times or an apocalyptic battle. A lot of them want to hasten the apocalypse because if you're told that the apocalypse will lead to you leading in a kingdom of gold and sitting by God, why, why wouldn't you, if you believe that, why wouldn't you want to hasten the apocalypse or, you know, wage holy war? So I don't know. I, I don't know where this goes. I don't know what happens with Trumpism. I don't think it's going to, I don't think it's just going to go away. I, 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 I do not believe like a lot of other people that I know that if Donald Trump gets defeated, that suddenly everything's fine. I don't think that's true. I think Trump is a symptom and not the disease. And uh, we have a lot of work to do. And, and again, this is one of the reasons why I am hopeful about the current movement is it's making us talk about uh, deeply ingrained ideas that haven't been challenged in the past and, um, you know, it's getting the conversation rolling real fast. I saw a question, um, totally enraptured by these events, very significant to me, understand this stuff and how can I act accordingly, but also need to research. What I would say is this when I, um, uh, so I, I have to talk about the book for a quick second. Cause you know, I saw somebody say, and it was very, very nice of somebody to say that they wish the book was coming out sooner. I do too. I wish it was coming out right now uh, in the midst of all of this. I think it's got some answers. It's called American Rule, How a, a, a Nation Conquered the World but Failed Its People. Here's the good news in all of this. The good news is that this information's out there. I mean, I mean, to understand the current political moment, it's not hard. All you have to do is reject the easy sort of like uh, paved over narrative of American exceptionalism, which basically says that America was founded as good and as a chosen nation of God and everything that we've done has been perfect. And yeah, maybe we've had a couple road road bumps here and there, but we're, we're, we're God's chosen perfect nation. We, you have to get rid of that. And, you know, what you have to do is you have to reject these, again, streamlined versions and just to go to the sources find academics. I mean, they write about this constantly. When I started the book American Rule, I didn't know anything about the founding. I, you know, I just got that sort of 
you know, what, an afternoon in like fourth or fifth grade or something where it's like, oh, here's what the Constitution is. Here's what the Declaration of Independence is. I didn't know how the, the Constitution was written by Madison's notes. Um, the notes from the Constitution should scare the living hell out of you. It was a bunch of elites, most of them slaveholders, getting in a room saying, hey, um, the poor people can't be trusted. We have to create a government that doesn't allow them power. And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. How do we handle slavery? Well, white people are better than black people, so we'll just handle it that way. And you actually see that the American government and the American experiment was designed to hold people down and to create basically a caste system in power. I didn't know that. I also, weird, weird little anecdote, and I don't know if you all know this, the Constitutional Convention wasn't actually the Constitutional Convention. They were there to revise the Articles of Confederation, and James Madison got there before everybody and just created a new constitution, and everybody showed up, and they were like, what are you up to? And he's like, well, I'm writing a new constitution. I'm creating a new government. And they're like, well, we don't have authority to do that. And he's like, eh, sure we do. Let's just do it. Which I had no clue. I had no idea that any of this worked this way. So my answer is go back and get the sources because academics talk about this. They, and I keep talking to other academics. They're like, did you know this? And they're like, oh, yeah, for sure. And they're like, I'm, I'm hoping you get the word out on this because academics have been so siloed away from the public because of, you know, the, the right wing war on education and uh, intellectuals that they haven't been able to get the word out. But it's all out there as long as you don't read these um you know, any book that talks about Reagan on a horse or shit. I, you, you go out and you find actual sources and you look at what actually happened. And, and all of a sudden it becomes very clear. And all of a sudden what we thought America was, it turns out it's not. And all of a sudden you realize you're like, oh, this whole thing has been kind of an illusion since the beginning. And there's an actual history out there. And when you learn the actual history, all of a sudden everything else becomes very clear. I was very... Um, you know, I had a conventional idea about how history and politics worked. Um, I was covering the campaign in 2016, and I, you know, I had an understanding of the Southern strategy and what had happened with Fox News and right-wing propaganda and, you know, what the main political fights were. But I didn't understand history until I did this research. It, it, it was right there for the taking. And once you find it, all of a sudden you're, in an you're at an advantage. And the more that you can tell people, um, the more power it is for people. So, yeah, just the research. All right, let's get another question. What are the takeaways from the Georgia election disaster? I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but election 2020 is going to be a mess. Um, it's not bad enough that the Republican Party can't win free and fair elections because they're actually a minority fascistic party um, that, you know, through gerrymandering and disenfranchising and intimidation and misinformation, that's the only way they're able to win elections, which means that, you know, one of the two major parties in this country are completely dedicated in their survival to making sure that people don't vote. We also have a generational pandemic. Uh, which is going to drive down numbers because people are going to be afraid. Who knows how the states are going to deal with it. We're not actually addressing the problem early enough to start working on a solution. Um, our voting systems are totally vulnerable and screwed up, and we have no idea what's going on. Um, and, you know, I live in Georgia. Our governor is not interested in people voting because when people vote, he loses and his party loses because Georgia is becoming... Um, more and more liberal and progressive. So what do I take from this Georgia debacle? I take that we need to do some very, very hard work to try and ensure that our votes will be counted and that this election will be stolen, which I, I hate to tell you this. And again, I came on here talking about hope. I came on here last week talking about hope. I'm trying to talk about hope and talk about actionable actions. Um, but no, I can't tell you for certain that 2020 will be a free and fair election. I can tell you for certain that if it's not a free and fair election and if there's not a problem with it not being a free and fair election, that we're looking at a uh, precipitous decline. And, you know, this is one of those, if we don't get this right, if we don't get Donald Trump out, I, I, there's no telling what's going to happen. Um, you know, you, you, you think he's joking when he talks about not observing term limits. He's not authoritarians don't care. They don't care for your laws or your customs or, or your constitutions or, you know, precedent. They don't care. Like this is like, you know, a dictator in, in another country in what we used to think of in the second and third world countries. 
um, you know, getting in power and just being there until they can't be there anymore. And, and, you know, it's not like Trump is the end of it. You have, you know, Trump Jr., you have Ivanka, and then you have, you know, assholes like Tom Cotton. I mean, yeah, if, if, you, if you want a free and fair election for the rest of your life, this is the one to really fight for. I'm curious, what do I think the national leadership on COVID-19 would have looked like? That is a great question. And, you know, I, I, I'm really pissed off. Let, let, let's get real for a second. We've been failed on every front with this pandemic. And, you know, I'm sure that you've had this too. It's like you can't even find consistent information, which is what happens in times of lax leadership. Um, if we would have had a competent president or even a halfway competent president, you would have had somebody who at least would have had a consistent follow, followable thread, right? This is what the disease is. This is what's happening. Donald Trump couldn't do that. He's incompetent, completely incompetent, which is why he's an authoritarian. Authoritarians are inherently incompetent. And so as a result, they're incapable of creating working structures. They undermine experts because experts terrify them. Um, you know, so he couldn't let an expert talk. He needed to be the center of attention. So you had a situation where we didn't even know what was going on. And so you have a bunch of different sources start to fill that vacuum, right? The leadership should have filled that vacuum and said, this is what's happening. Here's what we're doing. Here are the plans. I'm pissed off, man. The numbers across the country are going up like crazy. People are dying left and right. I mean, you know, you see the, the estimates of 200,000 by the end of summer, God knows where it's going to go after that. We're not in a second wave. We're in the first wave because this country has failed in every regard. I tweeted about this earlier. People are going to look back later and they're going to be like, why did the country not recognize even what was happening? And it's because political institutions and political parties like the Republican Party uh, survive based on misinformation and propaganda. They have to create an alternate reality where they can win, which has nothing to do with the actual reality that we live in. So actual leadership would have at least given us a goal. It would have said that we you know, need to stay in. We need to wear masks. We would have had a president who would have worn a mask, period, and said, this is how you model good behavior. And here's what we do. And we're all in this together, yada, yada, yada. And we move forward. Trump couldn't have been more of a failure. And, you know, it's, it's going to be... <sighs> By the way, we're getting up on July 4th, so my fellow Georgians are celebrating early. You know, we're, we're looking at a country that's given up. That's the only way to put it. We're just going to watch people die, and we're going to pretend like it's not happening. And we are, unfortunately, going to suffer. And we're going to suffer because America is coming apart at the seams because we can't agree on anything approaching shared reality. And, and that's really tragic. And people are going to look back on it and they're going to shake their heads. It's, it's going to be something that really puzzles people for a long time. It's going to be like, um, I assume some of you are of the age that you remember where everyone was trying to figure out what happened on Easter Island or at Roanoke or whatever. People are going to look at America and just shake their heads and be like, how, how did millions of Americans get lost in an alternate reality? And that's going to be where it's at. Unions, any comments during the Reagan administration it seems, this is from Kat. It was the start of breaking unions along with massive negative brainwashing. Today's America dislikes unions. Um, and I saw there was another one that was about police unions. And I, I want to throw two answers out with that. Um, one of the things that you need to understand about American politics is that it works as, as like a pendulum. And I talked about this a little bit last week and, and on the podcast, the Muckrake podcast. Um, you have periods in American history where Americans forget that they have power and Politics and culture just sort of becomes a spectacle. It becomes something that you you watch, right? You just all of a sudden watch like robber barons, you know, gather up all power and all of their wealth and there's nothing you can do. What could I ever do? And then all of a sudden you see on the other side of the spectrum, it shifts. Like, I think it's happening right now. I really, really hope it's happening right now. All of a sudden Americans wake up and they realize that they have power. And when you join together and you use that power, you're undefeated. Like the, the truth is sovereignty comes from the people. And as long as you recognize that, and as long as you realize that collective action can create actual 
uh, change and reform and progress, it's unbelievable. It can change literally everything. Well, unions are part of that. And they were systematically destroyed. And, and by the way, if you want to learn the actual history of America, look at the labor unions and, and look at how this whole thing has worked. Because so much of it has had to do with, you know, creating situations where people feel like to join a union is un-American. Right. All of a sudden, if you join a union, it means that you're a communist or a socialist. And if you join a union, it means that you're weak or it means that you can't make it on your own, which is a total myth. Right. The meritocracy in American capitalism has never been real. It's always been a completely rigged game. It just so happens that the game gets even more rigged when people uh, give up their ability to have collective action because, you know, the robber barons and other people. And if you don't know this, this is nuts. I actually didn't know this. Robber barons and the wealthy at the turn of the 20th century were like hiring mercenaries to go out in the streets and the National Guard was joining them, mowing union members down. I'm talking about like machine gun nests, killing men, women and children. And and you had like entire private mercenaries going out into America and killing and uh, undermining collective action. I mean, it was it was more or less a um, it, it, it's more or less a civil war that's being paid for by the wealthy. Which, by the way, if we defund the police, if we re relocate funds from the police, you're absolutely going to have to worry about privatized paramilitary law enforcement, which is something we, 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 we need to talk about that. We need to get it taken care of before we do anything else. We need to wrap our heads around it and sort of understand what change and, and, and reform would actually mean. Now, going back to the idea of unions, I really hope, and I don't know how you all have felt, but one of the things that the pandemic has reminded me because, you know, when America is just sort of puttering along and, and definitely during our capitalistic system we have right now, you get so caught up in making sure that you are getting yours and that everybody else is sort of your competitor. And, yeah, you may love them and you may work with them and they may be your friends or your family or whatever. But, like, you have to get yours and you always have to hustle and you have to bust your ass and you, you have to get to the other side. Right. One thing that the pandemic reminded me, because, you know, it shut everything down. It made me really take into consideration the things that matter and the people that matter. I started to really rely on the people I knew and loved and cared about. All of a sudden, it really brought up the idea that it was like, oh, yeah, the government right now in America, 2020, is bought and paid for. It is completely corrupt. And, you know... It, 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 it serves the interest of the wealthy and the powerful and the elite. And the rest of us, like, they gave us, what, a $1,200 check, which, hey, I didn't even get yet. So good luck, everybody. And they threw $1,200 at us. Well, meanwhile, around the world, other countries are like, God, we really need to take care of this financial crisis. I started to realize, like, I have to give up on that government, the Trump administration, ever doing anything that actually helps me or the people I care about or actually helping Americans outside of Donald Trump in a, you know, a small circle of, of criminals. All of a sudden, I started realizing that I could rely on other people. Like, I could rely on the people close to me, the people in my neighborhood, the people that I love, the people in my family, the people I care about. That's what collective action is. That's what unions are. It's looking out for each other and making sure that you come to the table and you're not divided and you're not warring against each other. It's really my hope that we can recognize that again and that we can get to the point where all of a sudden collective action and uh, union and organizing and all of that, that will actually come together because, and I keep saying this on the podcast and I'll say it again here. What's so exciting about this movement right is that it's not top down. There's not like a figurehead. There's not like a leader who is out there calling the shots and is on CNN every night, like saying, here's what we want, here's what we want. It's bottom up. And when you see this, the pendulum swing from Americans not having power to Americans having power, it's when you start to realize that everything should be bottom up. Like everything at the top should be determined by what's happening at the ground level, what's actually happening with populist politics and, and what's happening with organizing. We forget that. And one of the reasons we forget that is because in the 1980s with Ronald Reagan and uh, neoliberalism, all of a sudden it becomes everything's top down. 
trickle down economics, which I assume that you, um, you know, have heard of at this point, which is a complete and utter lie. And everyone knows it's a lie and it's never actually worked. And every time that we've tried, tr tried trickle down economics, what we've actually watched is we've watched that it doesn't trickle down and it leads to a market that explodes because it turns into hypercapitalism that has uh, no interest whatsoever in lasting or being working or, or working or serving the interest of people. There's a reason why the stock market actually reacts positively whenever it's bad for us and whenever it's bad for our economy or our lives. Like our system has been rewired and it started in the 1980s. And if you want to actually understand how it works, you need to go back into the 1940s or even the 1930s with FDR, see how it got changed and then see how it got changed in the 1980s and then sort of like compare and contrast the two because it was it was a complete uh, deconstruction of the social safety net that we started seeing in the 1930s and 40s, which has led to where we are now. But I have a sincere hope and I'm going to end here in a few minutes, but I just want to say I have a sincere hope that things are changing. Um that, that, that bottom up over top down, it, it works every single time. I, uh, I just want to say, I, I've, I've noticed uh, in the chat, there are a few uh, healthcare providers here tonight. And I just want to say, first of all, cheers. I have a lot of people in my life who uh, are healthcare providers or who have obviously um, depended on them. And... I just want to say, going back to what I was saying earlier about illusions and sort of the narratives that we tell ourselves about America and, and how they're, they're not true and they're manipulative and they're false. You know, it's this thing where it's just like every politician in America, like, was tackling each other to try and get in front of a camera and call first responders and, and, and healthcare providers heroes. And, you know, we, we saw one commercial after another, which was just like, you know, what? like gushers talking about the real heroes and you know now more than ever and in these unprecedented times or whatever the truth is that our priorities have not been real for a very long time it's very easy to sort of pay you know lip service to those things i'm sure that 9 11 first responders who couldn't get their health care taken care of even while they were running into the burning twin towers would would tell you if they were alive if they are around to talk about it, um, this country's priorities and the way that it's uh, treated its its heroes. Also, veterans. I mean, veterans aren't taken care of. It's really sad. And I can say that on a human level, and I'm sure that other people who are um, sort of listening to this uh, can say as well. You know, when humans, again, bottom up over top down. Top down, you're a number. You're, you're just a number to be serviced in a technocratic state. Uh, bottom up, you're our neighbors, you're, you know, our cousins, our sisters, our brothers, our, our, our parents. Um, all of a sudden, when you start looking bottom up as opposed to top down, you start to realize that real people are being harmed instead of just numbers, which is what pisses me off about this pandemic is how, you know, they, they have just, they didn't even try and beat it. They didn't even try to knock it down. And then they said, we're going to reopen. And, and by the way, I, I, I just want to go on a quick rant. It just exposed that the Republican Party is not actually pro-life. It never has been. That's a political cudgel that they created in, you know, the 70s and the 80s to, you know, get more evangelical voters. The actual motivating ideology is uh, patriarchal white supremacy, and it has been since the civil rights movement. And now, you know, it's just a it's a completely messed up system where they say, oh, well, if numbers go up again, we're going to we're going to shut things back down and everything will be fine. And we're not going to reopen if the numbers go down or if the numbers go up. The numbers are going up. We can all see it. We all know it. The first wave is still going. And if we're not lucky or yeah, if, if, if we're not lucky, it's just going to roll into a continuous wave in the fall. Um, I guess I would end with this, which is um, be safe, you know, um, if you can go out and protest, take precautions. This is a movement that has to continue. I think it's making actual headway. I think it's actually doing good. It's inspiring people. Um, you know, there, there's this old idea that I think that we need to hold, which is if you want to be part of a revolution, it doesn't mean that you're going to see the revolution end. There are parts to them. You know, there, there's a generation that goes out and marches and displays, um, you know, sort of uh, a civic understanding or desire for change and it inspires people underneath them 
you know, kids right now are watching this. The next generation is watching this. They're going to be a lot more political, politically active. They're going to grow up thinking that they have power versus, you know, watching this stuff on TV and feeling powerless. But you as a person, remember how the last four years have felt. Remember how the Trump administration has made you feel not only, you know, acted upon and ashamed, but how at times it's been like, well, you know, he, he the impeachment's not going to work and Mueller isn't going to work and this isn't going to work and he can do whatever he wants at any time. That's what they want. They want you to be demoralized. They want you to be apathetic. They want your energy to be destroyed. They want your will to be crushed. That's how authoritarians and how dictators and fascists operate. That's one of the reasons they threaten. That's one of the reasons that they, you know, are violent. It's one of the reasons why they show up at statues with AR-15s. You have to continue fighting. And you have to continue believing that you can make a difference. Because you're making a difference right now. It's obvious that the conversation in this country is changing and the awareness in this country is changing. So keep after it and, and cheers, everyone. Here's to victories. All right. We're going to have a muckrake podcast uh, tomorrow. It will come out on Tuesday. Uh, if you haven't already, please go pre-order American Rule, How a Nation Conquered the World but Failed Its People. Um, absolutely. The French people lost repeatedly until they didn't. Absolutely. You want to you study some stuff? Don't just study the revolutions that we all know. Go and look how the revolutions happened. And then look at what happened after the revolutions. Look at a three-dimensional sort of a thing, which you can do in American Rule, How Nation Conquered the World but Failed Its People. Um, yeah, thank you so much for hanging out. Hopefully next week, uh, all things considering, if we're all well, we're all healthy, we're all safe, we'll come out, we'll have another bourbon, we'll talk. Thank you, everyone. You are the best. Cheers. Later.